Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, somebody can stop me if I'm going on too long here. And I'm on that note, I will uh, be raising a five and two minute card to help uh, you with unfortunately, that. Unfortunately, I can't see you. I'm trying to oh, look. I'm coming. <laughs> Are you going to be in the middle? Are you the bull? <laughs> okay, so let's get going here. Um, many of the topics that I'm going to address in the next 10 minutes have already been uh, touched on by various people who will, I'm sure will enlarge on them. Uh, so let's right, get at this here. Now, I would say that up to now, it could be argued that climate change has been largely of concern to scientists and people concerned with the environment in a general way, and that in the public eye, it's there, but it's not primary. It sometimes becomes primary and other times it's not, because somehow it's still off in the future. So one message I have for you, climate change is not in the future, it's happening now. And I'll mention uh, something about that. Furthermore, it's not just sort of an interesting thing that might be happening, it's of critical practical concern. And I think, in fact, we have either crossed or are irreversibly committed to crossing a threshold soon. Uh, it's not sometime in the future, and that's because if you know anything about climate change, we're already committed to even more warming that there's nothing we can do about in the next, uh, to the end of the century, of at least a degree, probably. If that happens, even the little, the signs of things happening now are just going to continue to accelerate and more issues will uh, face us. Uh, all you have to do is ask the people in Australia to think of it. They maybe are beginning to believe about climate change and maybe it has a consequence. Floods, fires, more floods, giant cyclones, droughts. What else? What else? We can uh, go to the Bible and, and search for all the pestilences and they'll probably all happen uh, shortly. And one of the things that's been um, uh, clearly understood is that if you look at one measure of the world around us, the sea surface temperature associated uh, with the seas near Australia, warmer seas, more energy in the atmosphere, more of these kinds of events. And of course, they influence whether or not we have enough food. Price of food goes up, people get unhappy, and they overthrow governments, at least part of the reasons. So this is not trivial anymore, and I think people maybe are beginning to get this. It's not just for public contemplation, but need for action. Paper just came out in Nature. I heard it on the CBC. Uh, Francis Veers, who I know, who's at the University of Victoria now, talking about how they have clearly now connected the increasing uh, rainfall in the northern hemisphere with increasing temperatures. And it's completely logical. The warmer it is, the more water there is in the atmosphere, and eventually that water's got to come out somewhere, and it does. And uh, we know that that's happening. The climate change that we're facing uh, is unple unprecedented in human history. And uh, if it continues uh, uh, along the track where we're heading now, we'll see conditions uh, that have not been seen for 15 million years and possibly 50 million years. And ecologically, the world, never mind the fact that humans are here and messing things up, ecologically, the world was a very different place under those conditions. So what are we going to see? We'll see major shifts in species distributions. And there's demonstrations that this is already beginning to happen. Uh, and uh, the classic example is the people in the north are reporting animals uh, and insects that have never been seen in the far north. Uh, and we're going to see changes in ecosystem composition and structure. And uh, we've had uh, Dirk talking about the mountain pine beetle. It's not the only example. There are other places where this is happening as well. And you just need to go out there and ask yourself, is the forest the same as it used to be? And it isn't. My back forest, which I have, is no longer the same. The trees have dropped their needles, it's much more open, something is happening, it wasn't there before. Never mind all the things that humans are adding on top to all of this. Uh, what about our biological diversity? Well, our biological diversity is the legacy of many thousands, hundreds of thousands, and maybe in some cases millions of years of processes. We're just beginning to understand this. We have no idea. Best we can do is map them and say there's one here and another one here and another one here. When you have rapid change, biodiversity changes very rapidly and rare and uncommon species disappear. Just ask the mammoth if you could. It's gone. And maybe humans had some role 
but rapid climatic changes around 10,000 years ago clearly had a role where the rate of environmental change was much greater than the rate of the capacity to adapt. So some of the things we know from looking at models. Western red cedar, our provincial tree, is going to get hammered in southern British Columbia. It's already suffering. We don't have to imagine this. It's happening. And when I kind of considered this issue about 20 years ago, I had no idea that within 20 years we would be able to see uh, these changes taking place. Models indicate that the uh, northern British Columbia may have climates like the Okanagan by the end of the century. Uh, but think about that. How do you make northern British Columbia the Okanagan in less than a lifetime? How do you do that ecologically? We don't know how that happens. We have no idea. It won't be pretty, I can tell you that. It will be very rapid and there will be dynamic changes. We already know that the temperature in northern British Columbia is 3.5 degrees centigrade in the winter warmer uh, over the last century. That's 3.5 degrees centigrade measured warming over the last century. This is not trivial. This is huge. Thank you. Uh, what we do understand is if you put more energy in the atmosphere, and that's what climate change is doing, there's going to be more action. And all of that is going to cause all sorts of changes. So we need to be concerned here now, today, about mitigating and adapting to climate change. We can't just wait for something to happen. We have to do something now. Particularly, we have to adapt because we know there's going to be change because it's already happening. So we can't wait. And adaptation takes time. Uh, you have to change systems, the, the laws, as we're going to talk about here, social norms, test and, uh, new strategies, develop new strategies, new infrastructure, new ways of thinking, new attitudes, new worldviews, or old worldviews brought back again uh, from people who do respect what the natural environment uh, means. Mitigation also will take a long time before we can actually get things to change and slow, at least slow down. And it also gets people, needs people to change the way they think. So 15 to 20 years from now, now we say, no, nobody can drive around or emit any carbon today. It's so bad, we've got to change today. Well, we can't do that in such short periods of time or the consequences will be miserable for us. So I'm going to look very quickly at three ecologically linked processes, science-based processes. Water, primary productivity, and soils and carbon. And I may not put too much on that because I think there are people who are going to talk about that. But what about water, the processes of hydrology? We deal with water now, if we have too much, by straightening our creeks. Or if we don't have enough, we try to find some more, dig bigger holes, build bigger dams. We don't use nature for this. We ignore nature and we try to find simplified human solutions. And we've got droughts and flooding to deal with. What do we need to do? We have to foster fully functioning national natural watersheds. And that means a big landscape with a whole bunch of people talking about what we want and what we need, and laws and policies that do that. What do we need to think about? Wetlands, preserving wetlands, having complex streams, having tree cover, because the amount of tree cover influence what happens to the water and how fast it leaves, and reversing the trends that we have right now to have impermeable surfaces. Let's pave it all. Let's get the water leaving the land and going somewhere. Oh, yeah, my God, it's going in the stream. Oh, my goodness, it's flooding Australia or something. Uh, but we know these are the problems. Primary productivity. Uh, very important both in mitigation and ad adaptation. What do plants do? What did you learn in school? The most important thing plants do. They do photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is now the one reliable natural way the green way of getting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. What are we doing? Chopping down photosynthesis all over the world. We have to reverse that trend. In fact, it is urgent now that we cover the world with as much photosynthesizing material as possible. Healthy, living forests. And that you don't remove any more. These are your friends, your allies, your parents in a sense because of what they do, what they uh, do through primary productivity. Eventually, we end up eating either directly or indirectly. So we need to work toward preserving and maintaining photosynthesis. And that means trees. And there is a huge opportunity for us because we've whacked a whole bunch of it down to bring it back. Don't lose what you have and add more stuff in terms of forest cover and plant cover that's well integrated and growing well um, so that we can have that photosynthesis doing what it needs to do. Uh, 
taking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and furthermore, within the ecosystems in which it lives, putting some of that carbon dioxide into the ground where we've also depleted the landscape. Soils, and we'll have people address that issue here. But let's not forget, we've puffed out into the atmosphere through our sort of smoking process, whatever you want to call it, of you know, sucking down the carbon from all of our soils. There used to be tons more carbon in the, in, in the ground, and there's a huge opportunity. So I think we really need to think about that and get back to that whole issue. So now, what does this fundamentally mean? It fundamentally means that we need to maintain ecosystems and their functions, bring them back all over the landscape, essentially stop eating nature, uh, because we can't survive without it. So some of the things um, I just want to emphasize that we need to pay some attention to. So these, those are the processes that are key. Uh, I said this, I'll say it again. We need to take no more for nature. We need to sustain it. We need to uh, maintain the vital ecological processes that I've talked about and many others. And that'll keep take care of biological diversity. Two, uh, in this process, we have to be real and accountable. And what that means is whatever we do, we have to have a carbon standard and not the dollar standard. And the carbon standard, I mean about, when I talk about carbon, I mean the living things, the carbon in the soil and everything. So the first thing you do is not worry about how much money you can make on a carbon offset, but actually know whether, in fact, what you're doing is beneficial in terms of the carbon. Is it releasing carbon? Uh, never mind from fossil fuels, but from living systems. And are you doing something that's actually putting carbon back? And that has to be the primary measure. Never mind the business component. That will come, but we have to have the science absolutely right. And then the other thing that comes with this is whenever we emit carbon dioxide uh, through whatever activity, a lot of it does have effects in the landscape, is make sure that what return we get on it is real that we get a real biggest possible return in terms of values, in terms of profits, in terms of jobs. So the laws and policies must support this uh, conservation and restoration of nature for all of these very good reasons. And there's one other thing I'd just like to add. We are incredibly ignorant about things. I know my time is up. We just don't know about a whole bunch of things we should know a lot about. Like we don't know much about carbon. I just tried to do a report for part of British Columbia to get some values about how much carbon there was in the soil in different ecosystems. Could, did I have a single value that was meaningful for this part of British Columbia, which, by the way, has very high biological diversity, and biological diversity we know measurably is tied to high carbon storage values? The answer is I couldn't find one. I could partition the landscape effectively, but I had to read some report on prairie soils and carbon, some uh, general wetland data. We have none of this information. We vitally need it to make the proper decisions to the proper information. And frankly, we need to get some people out of their offices, into their boots, and on the landscape, put on our boots, get in the field, boots not suits. Let's go forward. Thank you, Dr.